Disney is for some a world of wonder, joy, and imagination. It's been there for most of us our entire lives, but with nearly 100 years of operation, there have been many claims that suggest a less than wonderful reality that betrays the squeaky clean image that Disney so fiercely protects. In this video, we take a look at some of the most popular claims about the dark side of the House of Mouse. Our first theory is one so bizarre that you might say it gives you chills. But this assertion is less about what Walt Disney did in life, but more so in death, giving a whole new meaning to Disney on ice. Sometimes the rumor goes so far to denote where Disney's frozen body or head is stored. And one of the most popular suggestions for its current resting place is deep in the heart of Disneyland, under the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. What gives credit to this theory is the company's founder Walt Disney's own very famous reputation as an innovator who was fascinated by the future and making the impossible possible. Walt Disney passed in 1966, but in 1964, a book entitled The Prospect of Immortality, written by the founder of the cryogenics movement, Robert Edinger, was published which discussed the premise of cryonics, meaning the idea of cryogenically freezing someone was in the air before Disney's death, and plausible that he was aware of it. Edinger himself was later frozen after his death in 2011, along with 100 other people who hoped for reanimation. According to the PBS News, in the weeks after his death, a tabloid reporter claimed to have snuck into the hospital where Disney was a patient at the time of his death and saw a cryogenic metal cylinder in which he was suspended. There have often been rumors about his impending thawing around certain dates. The most recent projected defrosting was December 2021, as it would have been the 55th anniversary of his death, but it came and went without any remarkable update. Some have gone so far as to claim that the film Frozen was titled as such so that Google results with Disney and Frozen would populate with stuff about the film, pushing the conspiracy theories down in the results. Why Disney would wait until 2013, nearly 47 years after his death to do so, remains unexplained. Whether you believe it or not, the facts remain that according to his death certificate, Walt Disney was cremated two days after his death and his remains were interred in an urn at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. The claims have also been denied by his family, with Walt Disney's own daughter remarking that she doubted her father had even heard of cryonics before his death to begin with. But Walt Disney's passing isn't the only one to garner mystery. Those that subscribe to this next theory suggest that in order to maintain their fun, loving, and safe reputation, if someone were to die in a Disney theme park, the staff would work to ensure that they were not actually pronounced dead until they were taken somewhere else. One example of an occurrence like this would be in 1964, when a 15-year-old boy fell out of the toboggan on the Matterhorn ride at Disneyland. He would be found unconscious in the ride, but would die four days later at a hospital. However, there are several news stories of tragic deaths that occur on Disney property, which specifically state them as dying at the scene, making this one seem unlikely. For example, in 1984, a 48-year-old woman died on the Matterhorn as well. According to witnesses, she was on the track and she was hit by the next toboggan coming through the ride. She would be declared dead at the scene. On Christmas Eve 1998, a man died after a mooring cleat for the Columbia sailing ship became loose and hit him. In 2003, a 22-year-old man died on the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad ride when the train car derailed after breaking free from the locomotive while inside a tunnel. Ten other passengers were injured, but he reportedly died on the scene. There doesn't seem to be any sort of cover-up, as the president of Disneyland Resort at the time, Cynthia Harris, made a statement acknowledging the accident and expressing condolences. And finally, one of the most infamous deaths at a Disney park was that of Deborah Stone on July 8, 1974. Deborah Stone was a cast member and worked for the now-defunct America Sings attraction at Disneyland. The attraction utilized a merry-go-round-like system in which six theaters rotated around a central stage with various scenes. As a hostess in the attraction, Stone was to stand to the left side of the stage and welcome guests to the show. And when the 24-minute show ended, she'd bid them farewell. Unfortunately, one night, Stone became trapped between a stationary wall and a moving wall. She was crushed to death and it's reported that a guest heard screaming coming from the walls. The LA Times article announcing her death noted that she was the first employee death in the park's history. Though, since Stone's death, a contracted employee later died in the hospital after an accident at the resort. Probably due to its historic and horrific nature, there are urban legends that say Stone haunts the area where she was killed and can be heard warning people to 
be careful. While incredibly unfortunate, this list of accidents goes to show that this rumor is far from true. As for what's actually listed on someone's death certificate as place of death, that I don't know. But I doubt it reads, the happiest place on earth. Walt Disney was a powerful figure. Whether it was creative, corporate, or political, his influence knew few limits, making him the target of all sorts of interest and suspicions. This next theory suggests that while a master storyteller, he was also known to sing, like a bird. The theory states that Walt Disney served as a secret informant to the FBI in Los Angeles for about 26 years, and some claim that he turned in his co-workers and friends. This first became public in 1993 when writer Mark Elliott published an unauthorized biography of Walt Disney. At the time, the New York Times was provided with a copy of an FBI file on Disney given to them by Elliott, who obtained it via the Freedom of Information Act. The New York Times confirmed the authenticity of the information that came from said files. However, due to the fact that much had been redacted from the files, they couldn't confirm specific names included in the file. The Times seemed to confirm that Disney operated as a secret informer to the LA Bureau from 1940 until 1966, when he died, and that the documents relay that Disney provided the Bureau with information on the activities of those in Hollywood suspected of subversive political, aka communist, beliefs. What we do know is that Disney testified in front of the House of Un-American Activities Committee in 1947. During it, he was asked if he employs anyone he believes to be communist or fascist, to which he responds, no, saying he believes all of his employees are 100% American. He's asked if he ever employed someone he felt was communist, to which he said yes. He would detail how a strike in his studio was orchestrated by people he believed to be communist, and mentioned a few men in particular by name. He also lists, quote, commie front organizations, which he claimed smeared him. Additionally, in 1954, Disney was labeled by the FBI as a special agent in charge contact, or SAC contact for short, which according to the New York Times is typically reserved for a trusted informer. Disney's wife Lillian and their daughter Diane stated that Elliot's biography on their husband and father contained many factual inaccuracies, more than 150 of them according to the family. As part of a statement they made about the book, the Disneys included a statement from former director of the FBI, William Webster, in which he states that the documents used for the book do not support the claim that Disney was an FBI informant as well as two other former agents who stated that Disney was not an informer during their time with the agency, nor at any other time to the best of their knowledge. It should be noted that the Disney family disagreed with quite a lot of the claims in Elliot's book, and not just the ones about Walt's relationship to the FBI. The statement from the Disney family also noted that even though Disney may have been designated a contact for the agency in the FBI papers, it doesn't mean that this was ever disclosed to Disney himself, meaning he could have been labeled as such without him ever knowing. Regardless, there obviously was some sort of relationship between Walt Disney, J. Edgar Hoover, and the FBI, but calling the head of the House of Mouse a rat might be a little unfair. For a lot of these claims, I think some people just find them too exciting to pass up on perpetuating. Unfortunately, quite often people hear these things, take them as truth, and keep saying them until they become an overwhelming belief, which, for a lot of reasons, is a problem. Of course, in regards to drawing your own conclusions, we invite you to be our guest.